version of um, Pilgrim's Regress we're using again. And, and uh, I just want to say hello. Hi, David Downing. Uh, welcome. And Mark. glad to have you again. Yeah, Thank glad you. to join you. I love the discussion two weeks ago. It's very uh, stimulating, very edifying. Well, we're using again, uh, the page numbers I'll reference are from your annotated version, but I know there are other versions and uh, page numbers out there. So um, we'll do our best. Yes, Eric, I see is holding up uh, a very similar version to the one I first read, my grandfather's copy from back in the day. One of those Erdman's versions. So yeah, we wanted to maybe uh, at least review briefly, Bob, you were mentioning these riddles here at the end of book three. And what's, what's, what's something that stuck out for you, Bob, um, in that exchange? Can I put you on the spot? What, what are these riddles? Uh, what's the significance? Well, I think it's just, it's, the purpose is just to explore, I think it's to expose how inadequate the spirit of the age was in answering the, the you know, the important questions, the deep questions that are, you know, that's, it's about as much as I would you know, I think there was some recurrence. I think this comes up again later in the book. There, it's right. back to this. But yes, reason. But Lewis is really attacking the spirit of the world, and that's what he saw as the spirit of the world. And, and what what is the spirit of the age? Uh, any particular thinkers uh, that Lewis fairly or unfairly, you know, depending on the reader, rightly or or not, uh, tried to associate with the spirit of the age? Anyone can join in, Bob, or anyone? What was the name of the, um, in, in book three, going back just a little bit further, who, who eventually led John, or you could say, uh, not led, but, but uh, captured John for the sake of the giant? What was the, the name of that character, to give it away? Anyone? Sigismund. So, so which, which pivotal thinker really uh, captured the spirit of the age in Lewis's telling here? Someone help me out. Sigmund Freud, yes, Freud. right. Yes, wish fulfillment, seeing through things, supposedly seeing things in all of their transparency, right? And yet reason comes along and... and slays this mountain, this spirit, through riddles. And I want to point out another theme that happens right at the end of book three, and I, I, I'd love for us to talk about um, how Lewis uses, I think, a very biblical illusion. Dan, you and I mentioned this the other week when we had a uh, Dan Hamilton. Um, you pointed out how Lewis will have, in moments very pivotally in the story, um, he uses silence. You can see on uh, the very last page of book page 56 in the annotated version it says there was silence for a time among the mountains this is right after reason tells them tells the uh the giant the, the spirit of the age uh kind of the wager and it says there was silence for a time this is a theme that comes up again and again in pivotal moments for john where there is um there is something either new, something pivotal, something that is causing uh, a deepening or a growth uh, in, in knowledge or maturity or movement. Uh, this is just me sharing my opinion now, but I'd love for others to chime in if they've noticed these points of silence. I think Lewis uses them very well, I think intentionally and strategically. Silence for half an hour, I think he uses that particular phrase. Yes. Which is exactly, yes. which of course is the obvious an allusion to the, uh, the revelation there. Yeah, that comes in a later book, right? Oh, thanks. Yeah, Dan. I think at this point, the silence is because suddenly the stakes are escalated. You know, what, what's the pledge? What's the wager here? Well, your head. This is no longer a financial enterprise. This cuts to the core and you can see everybody else kind of stepping back like, whoa, they're playing for the ultimate stake here. Let's see what happens, but I'm not going to get involved. In it. And I, I may be, you know, overselling it, but it was something I've, you know, I've underlined almost every moment in the book, I think now, where 
Lewis just very says it very succinctly, but it seems it seems though the reader should, you know, if you have ears here, if if you're paying attention, pay particular attention. Um, Lewis also, I think, a number of times has sort of viewed either silence as the opposite of the noise of the world, and which he views as being kind of anti, almost antichrist, particularly with his view of the music of the music of the heavens, but. Uh, Short of that, you know, silence is a respite from the incessant noise of the world and the industrial, the industrial grindings and violence and stuff. There, it gives you, it gives your mind a chance to, uh, you know, to find itself. Mark, I also think you're onto something in Luce's other fiction. Um, it goes back to Kirkpatrick's method of teaching, which is often not to just tell you the answer, but to pose the question and to let you sit there and think about it and to achieve mm -hmm. some kind of solution on your own. If you look at the Narnia Chronicles and even in Paralandra, uh, Aslan doesn't just say, here's what you did wrong. Here's where you were prideful. Here's where you were selfish. He poses the question and he lets them figure out on their own what they did wrong or what the problem was. And I think you're exactly right. Lewis feels like we all have an inbuilt conscience uh, personified by virtue in, in this book. And he sort of wants you, the reason poses these questions and she really doesn't want to say, here's what's wrong with your thinking. She poses questions, can you figure out what's wrong with your thinking? So I think you're exactly right. I think pedagogically, it's much better to pose the question and let the student figure out what's wrong with their analysis rather than just telling them right away, here's where your, here's where your interpretation breaks down. So I think you're really onto something. I think he's actually thinking often the Holy Spirit doesn't just reveal himself and say, go read this verse, that will explain your problem. He really expects humans to uh, rise to the occasion, think about their own behavior or their own opinions and figure out the flaw. So I, I think that is an important, if, I don't know how many of you are teachers, but it's much better as a teacher to say, now, why doesn't that answer quite work? Or what data does that not account for? Rather than to say, here's why you're wrong. So I, I agree with you. I think the moments of silence are, are key in this, in this novel. For that matter, even at crucial times in Jesus's ministry, he would right. ask the question rather than give an answer there. You know, I mean, he was strategic there, but I mean, a lot of times he, he spoke and preached, but like when he was before the, you know, the learned, you know, the learned elite of the time there, the Sanhedrin or the, uh, you know, or the Pharisees in the, in the temple or whatnot, suddenly he, he, he reverted back to, I'll, I'll ask your question if you answer my question. You know. yeah, that's <laughs> so, yeah. I, I said, again, more support there. Oh, Does for that. Scourge take praise the incessant din of hell? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does none of those, uh, uh, I forget what phrase he used, none of those uh, nasty silences? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of earlier. I wonder if there's anyone who would like to join in on, I think this is a really um, interesting idea for me. I know as the moderator, you get stuck on what interests me, but uh, anyone else on the Idea of silence in the book or the end of book three, these riddles uh, before we get into book four. We're gonna do our best to get to, to the end of book 10 tonight. So I may move us on at times when we prefer not to, but uh, anyone else? And I will, I, I'll try to be somewhat didactic, somewhat teaching. Uh, you know, if I haven't heard from others who look interested, I may, I may uh, do a little bit of balancing tonight too. So bear with me. <laughs> If not, let's, uh, let's kind of proceed with Reason and John into book four, back to the road, right? For those of you, again, who uh, last week- I to interrupt, but you asked- Please, yes. I never quite got answered about the riddles. Uh, I would just like to say, I think he's pretty much demolishing Freudianism. Mm -hmm. He's saying, how can you see these things in the dark? Freud said, well, there's all these things happening in your unconscious. There's this uh, hatred of your father and the love of your mother, and there's all these sex and aggression going on. But we look at our own consciousness and I, we don't feel this excessive hatred for our father or our love for our mother. Uh, we don't feel all these sexual and aggressive impulses that are just waiting to break out. 
So he's saying, how do you know they even exist if you can't find it in consciousness and you can't find it through empirical data? How do you know it's not a total phantasm? So I, I would have to say the three riddles are really much Lewis, pretty much Lewis's critique of Freudianism. Uh, what's the original and what's the copy? Well, Sinsuk is the original, the longing for heaven, the longing for God, the longing for infinite uh, union with the uh, fountain of joy. And to think that that might be lust or that might be some other derivative. So I would, I would just, rather than leave your question hanging, I would like to say, I think that all three of the riddles are Lewis's critiques of Freudianism. It really doesn't hold up to uh, uh, close scrutiny. This was one of the first, this is 1933 when Freud was in vogue. When I went to graduate school in the seventies, Freud was still very influential. And Lewis is kind of sounding the death knell of Freudianism with these three questions, because later on, 20, 30, 40 years later, other people would ask these same questions of Freudianism. <laughs> Where's your empirical evidence? How do you know what's the deepest fundamental impulse and what's a derivative or a copy? So uh, it's a great question. I'm sorry that I'm, uh, I'm jumping in and interrupting you, but I do think it's worth uh, pondering that he was so prescient in realizing that Freudianism did not have staying power. It would not be the ultimate understanding of the human mind. No, David, I'm glad you did because um, part of what I'm doing as li I'm listening to you is trying to remember where, because reason goes and explains to John a little bit of what the questions meant. And I, 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 I was doing my own um, looking right. again. So no, thank you. I, I'm glad. Uh, the other riddle, he says, if you're trying to escape someone and they're as fast as you are and they swim as well as you are, Lewis said in, uh, uh, Bulverism, he wrote an essay where he said, well, how, if you're a Freudian and you say, well, your opinions, you're just a bundle of neurotic complexes. Well, why is that analyst not a bundle of neurotic complexes? Or if you're a Marxist and you say, oh, well, that's just your class prejudice. Then you say, well, what about your class prejudices? So it's one of those things where the critique cuts both ways and you're undercutting your own foundation. So all three riddles are explained uh, more more fully in Lewis's other works, but all three of them are a critique of Marxist theory and of Freud, Freudian theory. We've uh, last time talked about the arguments, kind of. There is the, there is the other. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. The other thing about uh, Freud talking about um, wish fulfillment, and isn't Freud's wish fulfillment that there is no God? Right, right. Then he can uh, then he can be his own God. So right. uh, the wish fulfillment concept works as a two edged sword. Right. And it also seems a lot like how Lewis goes after the two authors in The Abolition of Man. Uh, you right. know, you can't say anything is objective truth. It's just your state of, of feeling about things, except that for those two writers, they're the ones who are true, and it's not their feelings about what's true, right? right. <laughs> and they're going, why are you not questioning your own presumptions when, in fact, they're not questioning their own? So it's a, it's a great uh, a rhetorical flourish to be able to argue and understand that the other in book four, chapter three, I think is where they get into, if it's worth going into, that's where he gets into the book. Yeah, thank you, Andrew and Bob. And Bill uh, Evers, I think uh, I'll jump to you. I was just going to say, Andrew, this, the argument at the top of page 65 is exactly what Lewis, in summary, is saying here about wish fulfillment. The If religion is a wish fulfillment dream, whose wishes does it fulfill? <laughs> right. I just want to mention that uh, some of Lewis's uh, critiques of Freud and Marx here remind me a little bit of Karl Popper because Karl Popper says in The Open Society and Its Enemies, which he wrote during World War II, that uh, if, you don't, if you have a doctrine like Marx or Freud's uh, and it can't be falsified in any way, then he's not really sure it counts as social science or behavioral science. So anyway, obviously religion is trying to look at things from a different perspective, but uh, there is a similarity in the kind of challenge that Lewis poses to Marxism and to Freudianism. I wrote in my own notes, Bill, along those lines. Um, yeah, why why fear what you don't believe? As a, a rhetorical question, and you know, for the the students of belief and the history of different forms of belief. Uh, this this interplay between fear and desire 
uh, I think Lewis is really uh, trying to explore as well. Uh, we talked two weeks ago about these rules that um, for, for the, young, the youngest uh, age of our protagonist, John, uh, seemed to be the first encounter with um, not only uh, religion as institutional religion, but um, this broader concept of how the rules relate to uh, this kind of idea of the picture, the desire. And um, David Downing, you also mentioned the, the copy and reality. The, um, that, that comes out at, at another place later in the plot. And I'm wondering uh, what, what here as we wrap, book four is very short, but um, within Lewis's way of framing reason, uh, what, David, any, any help on how that connects later to again, Lewis bringing out that copy versus reality, uh, archetype, archetype, ectype um, heading there? Well, we saw that in Sinsla. He has a vision of a beautiful woman on an island, which is totally unstained and pure. And he spends the rest of the book trying to find that beautiful woman. And at first he falls for the brown girls, just basic lust in the woods there. And later it's disguised as media halfways, who seems to be romantic and sensual and sophisticated, but it turns out just to be lust all over again. So I know what the archetype and the ectype means uh, in terms of sense, I'm not quite sure what you're thinking about in terms of reason. I think just the reference to um, that it comes up first in this discussion between reason and John, um, that, that was merely the, I guess the idea I had in, in mentioning it, but um, I'm trying to remember where it comes up later in the book without jumping there. It's a lot, uh, it's a lot later, I think it comes up there, mm -hmm. eight or nine. So I think when we get there, we'll, we'll recognize it. Sounds to. good. Okay, I'll hold yeah. you to that, Bob. Hold get, me to that. We're going to get to contemplation. It's going to be a, a kind of a false fantasy of crossing the, the canyon. And later on, he's going to realize that was only imagination. That wasn't an actual crossing of the canyon. That, it, that may be what uh, Bob's referring to. Well, and, and reason comes in again in the plot line when John is having kind of that, um, what is it, the fear of death? Um, mm. Uh, kind of those those numinal moments of of seeing that image again at the beginning of the book, uh, he sees his uh, I believe Uncle George who who crosses the brook of death, and that kind of deep fear of death comes up again. And the character of reason she she's back again in in this cave we'll talk about, and it's that that fear of of not just the dark but the fear of all of those kind of childhood moments and memories. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some significance to that. What, what is Lewis, I say this very open-endedly, what, what is Lewis implying about reason? There's, there's the, there's the um, lineage of reason. She, she makes a, a very veiled allusion to who she's the daughter of. Um, but why, why the kind of brief, brief encounter here? And John just keeps going on his way. He meets up with virtue again. Uh, what's, what's Lewis saying about reason here? And I'll, I'll let that be open-ended. Well, I think natural reason is limited. You know, and, and so far, at least at this point, reason is, is sort of on the natural level there. You know, kind of, so it was kind of, so I think Lewis, I, John is feeling like, you got me out of this pickle with the giant there and you, you know, but I'm, I, he doesn't see her as being offering much help in terms of much more help than that in terms of his original intention of finding the island there. It's just the moment he's, he's still he's looking at virtue or someone else to uh, <laughs> pursue the way there. And reason, I think, recognizes that there's limits on what she can, what she can answer and what she can't answer. And she can't answer the island question for <laughs> Yeah, he, this is a lowercase l lady. And I, I think the quote at the very end of book four, um, I have no blessing to give, said the Virgin. I do not deal in blessings and curses. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really uh, informative line. Anyone mm -hmm. else pick up on that? What, what is, uh, what's the significance of not dealing in blessings and curses? Is reason just neutral? So Mark, I, my read is that 
Lewis is incredibly attracted to reason. I mean, right, all of his life, his upbringing was all about reasoning. I mean, studying under the great knock, right, uh, going to Oxford and getting firsts in the greats. It's, it's all about reason and philosophy. But Lewis also realizes that reason is the be all and end all of life. There's more, right? So, so th there's that that there's that constant tension I think in his thinking between me being able to reason everything out and that that sense of right that that island in the distance that he wants that is outside of reason, mm -hmm. and he tries to balance the two of them. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Anyone else? I thought reason gave um, some really reasonable uh, pieces of, you could say, advice to John about his encounter with the spirit of the age, uh, with Freudianism uh, characterized, so to speak. Uh, she says on a couple of pages, there is truth mixed up with the giant's conjuring tricks and you would be foolish, she says a little later, not to have profited at all by your stay in his, that is the giant's country. There is some force in the wish fulfillment doctrine. Uh, I think, again, there's a, there's a tempering. Uh, we may have covered that a little bit, but um, this isn't just, you know, oh, now that I vanquished it, um, you know, leave it all behind. Never, you know, never give it any of your um, memory or uh, your patience. Um, there's, there's, there's something that Lewis is already doing here, I think, in the narrative about um, the role of um, experience and uh, how it can contribute to true wisdom. But uh, those are, again, just some of my thoughts. Anyone else want to chime in before we move along the road again? Uh, Charles. I, yeah. I think that one thing, Lewis, his whole life was, was very adamant that you, you can't reason your way into heaven. And reason here does not give the answer. And uh, I thought, that's exactly right. That was a theme of his his whole life long. And it was something that bothered him. He had all this reasoning before he was 31 years old and finally became a Christian. But reason by itself could not, could not turn the corner for him. He really needed to have reason be a complement to what the Holy Spirit was saying, as opposed to reason replacing the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and that's, it seemed to me that was ha what was happening here too. John was sort of going, just, just tell it to me, you know, just, just fill me in and I'll just be fixed. And that wouldn't work. And so that's why reason was just sort of stepping aside from that saying, no, can't do that. It won't work. You know, actually, uh, he was very puzzled by in Romans chapter one, you know, where um, the Greeks, uh, the Romans, they, they didn't know anything about Jesus. They didn't know who he was. They didn't have the word of God or anything like that. But he still said they're without excuse because their reason showed them there was more than what they were imagining was going on. So, you know, they knew about God's divine power and, and, and you know, and so their their behavior was without excuse. So maybe it's more than just a compliment. It's also something that kind of compels you to say, I have to look further because there's more to it than this. Mm. No, thank you, Charles. I think that their comments also get us into that broad conversation about, um, you know, virtue, virtue is going to come right back on the scene. And when it comes to morality and ethics, right, is it just is it just discoverable by, you know, putting your mind to it? Uh, what is Same our... argument. Yeah, right. Same argument. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Doja, did you have something? I just had a couple of questions. There are two other significant limitations that Lewis uh, suggests about reason. And um, so it's in chapter two of the, of the book, and it is where reason says, but I can tell you only what you know. I can bring things out of the dark part of your mind into the light part of it. Mm -hmm. and then she says, I cannot uh, address things that are even that are not in the dark part of your mind. And then she goes further a little, uh, a couple uh, sentences later is, I have nothing to tell you of good and bad. And I thought that was really fascinating. I'm not sure I uh, 
followed it, but I think this, the dialogue we've had tonight gets us a little closer to that. Uh, reason's not going to get you to ultimate answers, but it can help you uh, along the journey. I think maybe that's part of it. That's helpful. Thanks, Andrew. Anyone else before we hit the road again? Mark Wimbush and then uh, Ruby. I just wanted to say that uh, later in the in the book, the same role is played by wisdom. Wisdom is helpful, just like reason, but neither one, as defined by Lewis, is in itself enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk more about wisdom, Mark. That's great. And Ruby? I, I have little to contribute because I haven't read this book and I've only read a couple of C.S. Lewis works, which I find fascinating. Um, I was a zookeeper for 20 years by occupation, so I'm very interested in animal behavior and such. And um, some of the things, some of the topics that you guys are discussing from the book remind me of basic concepts that I, I kind of make note of as a Christian working with animals. Um, there's this range of, of uh, instinct to intelligence. Um, there's everything in the animal kingdom that is in the human kingdom they have politics and there's animals that have slavery. There's animals that have agriculture. Um, they have emotions, they, they, they play, they laugh. There's every similarity with humans and animals, but animals don't have religion and animals don't study other animals. Humans are uniquely unique. And you guys are talking about what C.S. Lewis is talking about, the, the Freudian aspect. And I'm, I'm sensing there's gonna be an application when I do read this book um, of the splitness in humans, we, we have an instinct, you would say an instinctive drive for all of our fleshly wants. We're hungry, we eat, but we are uniquely unique because we also have an appetite to know God and truth. And our reason, our intelligence can only take us so far. There needs to be a spiritual element to connect with God. Oh, Ruby, so much there. Oh, thank you for your comment. Um, I, I'd love for others to maybe, uh, if they wanted to um, dialogue with Ruby a little bit, we, we could talk about much that you said, <laughs> but I want to just make sure we're uh, sticking to the road. But I think, yeah, you know, Lewis um, has a high view of uh, the animal kingdom, you know, from the Narnia, Chronicles of Narnia to, um, I think, some of his essays and, and the relationship as caretakers of creation as a christian he believes we should have a very high view of i think um all creatures great and small um anyone else just i i'd, I'd love to give that uh, ruby's comment a little bit of play here before we uh, march back and join virtue on the road yes. that's okay if not <laughs> for the road well, Ruby, uh, we hope it not only, I think I saw someone in the, in the chat say, you know, uh, even if you haven't read it, tonight would be the wonderful motivation to, to take up and read. Um, it's, yes, one of Lewis's more challenging works, but it, it's well worth the journey. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for jumping in and, and jump in again. If no one else has anything on book four, book five, The Grand Canyon. Uh, someone, I'll be again kind of the teacher, make others who have read it help us out. What is this Grand Canyon? Uh, where does it lie on the map? It has another name, a fancy Latin name. They call him Adam. Thank you, Bob. Yes, uh, Mark Wimbush. What is that roughly translated into English, if that's what you're going to share? Adam with? Sin. Yes, Adam Sin. Near this Grand Canyon, there is a, a really pivotal character that our companions meet who will tell this story of how this canyon came to be. Who can, uh, who can tell us a little bit about, we talked last time about in the publishing history of Pilgrim's Regress, uh, who some of the earliest readers thought Mother Kirk was supposed to represent, does oh. represent, may represent. Picking, picking Kirk, Mother Kirk has got to make you think of George McDonald there. Who was a who was a spiritual who Lewis identifies as one of his sort of spiritual leader. Back, of course, the Great Divorce. Of course, he was he was his guide there. So. Well, people thought it was a Catholic church. Certainly, some Catholics thought that. 
but it's really just supposed to be the overall church of Christendom. Sure. No, thanks, Bill. I think like, the Scottish part makes me, that's what makes me think of it being, uh, I don't think I'm referring to McDonald or at least giving his little nod of the head to George McDonald. I know one of our um, California based regular attendees. I don't know if Chris is here tonight again. He was two weeks ago, but he even did a little bit of reconnaissance, I think, with you, Dan Hamilton. And uh, if there's any, any more fruit from your uh, kind of going going back in that history or talking to other friends be sure to be sure to share down the road um but yeah dan if there's anything further that you gleaned in the last couple of weeks from chris um chris said he reached out to joseph pierce yeah uh, catholic author oh, hi, chris. and um oh there he is okay well no, chris no. you you tell it <laughs> no no you please proceed chris just uh sent joseph's response on to me and Joseph's pointed to two chapters of a book that I don't own where he talks specifically about the, uh, the reason that uh, many people thought this was a Catholic writer. Uh, I'll jump in a little bit. Um, Please, the, yeah. uh, the Catholic publisher, Sheedon Ward, which is actually a husband and wife couple who published Chesterton a lot. When they read the first edition from J.M. Dent, they thought the Puritania represented Protestant Northern Ireland and they thought that uh, he wanted the word, uh, he said in the letter, he, you couldn't have a character called Christianity. So he needed some term for, for Christianity that wasn't quite as obvious as Mrs. Christianity. Uh, so, but they thought it was specifically the Catholic church. They thought it was about the journey from Protestantism to being, becoming a Catholic. And Lewis was very upset by when the Sheed and Ward edition came out, he wrote to his brother and said, they're making me out to be a papist which is a term that you don't want, as a Northern Irishman, you don't want to be associated with Pappas. It's one of the few times you use that term. So yes, uh, they did think it represented the Catholic Church as opposed to this kind of uptight Calvinist uh, Northern Irish Protestantism. So, so who can tell me if it's correctly term. pronounced Pappas or Papist? I've certainly heard it as Papist. I thought it was Papist also. Yeah, maybe it's Papist. Yeah, maybe it is. It's, it's the Pope. We're talking about the Pope here. Yeah, right. So I, I found the Joseph Pierce reply, and uh, he wrote that many people believe that the author of the regress must be a Catholic, and rumors began to circulate in Oxford that Lewis had converted. The confusion was caused by his depiction of Mother Kirk, to whom Neo Angular, the T.S. Lewis, uh, T.S. Eliot type of Anglo Catholicism, had refused to submit. So it seemed to be, I mean, I remember we talked about Neo Angular. Um, but it it's, sounds like it was because Neo Angler refused to submit to Mother Church, and I guess if you know High Church T.S. Lewis type Anglo Catholicism didn't submit to Mother Kirk, I guess people assumed Mother Kirk must represent the Catholic Church. Thanks, Chris. Well, yeah, you know, know why, why doesn't he accept Mother Kirk's offer to take him across the canyon? Maybe that would suggest that he being an Anglican and she being a Catholic church that he wasn't willing to make that. He's not ready to submit to the church there. And that's, he's, been, he's still trying to find another way. So back to the plot, unless someone else wants to, you know, join us on the, um, on the detail here of the, the, the Textus Receptus. <laughs> um, Mother Kirk explains, for those of you again, who haven't read or are just joining us this week, Mother Kirk gives the history of um, what has happened in this landscape and how did it get this way? And uh, this gave for those from the sacred, uh, the book of uh, Genesis containing the story of the fall of humanity. There's uh, with uh, his retelling uh, with characters from John's uh, journey, um, a way of discussing, and we talked about two weeks ago, again, maybe the context of the why Lewis would choose to describe um, kind of this this place in in terms of, of land lord land owner. So uh, again, I thought um, David Downing that was uh, helpful uh, two weeks ago. You're talking a little bit about kind of the history of the relationship of um, I think it was the, the Irish and the broader uh, English and, and that relationship there. Yeah, I, I mentioned two weeks ago that the in Ireland there's a big problem with uh, absentee landlords. And people were paying a rent 
read to people that they had no idea who it was. They had a very vague image of who actually owned the building. Uh, I mentioned that the word boycott comes from the Irish refusing to pay their rents because their English landlords were so inattentive to their needs. So I think for a Northern Irishman, the idea of God as an absentee landlord is a very uh, natural metaphor for people who feel that somebody laid down all these rules, but we don't know who this person is. And we uh, don't really understand that person's nature or motives. Yeah. So I think it's a, for someone from Ireland, that, that's a great metaphor for the idea of God is out there and he, he uh, patrols us and he makes a lot of rules, but we don't really know him. God is an Irish, well, God is an Englishman for Irish. It's, it's, it's in this book. But I think, I think you always have to keep in mind that Lewis in his fiction says he's oftentimes trying to, he's trying to evade or get past the sleeping dragons. Right, right. I think this is, a, this is another, these kind of, kind of somewhat elusive, you know, definitions and terms are kind of part of that strategy that, you know, if you just, if you made it a straight metaphor, people would, would turn it off and say, oh, more of this stuff. But by kind of changing the story a little bit, you know, doing these kind of curious names there, I think it's part of his effort of trying to, you know, get, get past the sleeping dragons a bit there, at least get people to pay more attention to the content and not get put off by, uh, by John was, by, you know, <laughs> the horror of the church there, which is, we see, again, John is horror. The last thing he wants to do is the landlord, so. You know, he'll do anything to avoid meeting up with the landlord. Or well, I think my one, my one note in the annotated uh, edition, which I wish I could rewrite, is on page 28. When he first looks up at the mountains where the landlord lives, there's this beautiful exalted prose of the beauty of the mountains and the transcendent uh, splendor of the mountainscape. And I wrote that Lewis was great. He loved nature. But I think what I should have written is that's his first clue that the landlord is not at all who he thinks he is. The fact that landlord lives in these beautiful transcendent mountains should have been a clue to, to uh, John that he misunderstood who the landlord was. If we come up with another edition of the annotated Wade, I'm going to rewrite that footnote. But that's an early clue that he's completely misunderstanding who the landlord is. Oh, thanks, David. There's a lot, I think, just in the way Mother Kirk tells this story. Uh, I found myself jotting lots of notes, but maybe my own uh, education and, and vocation, um, just the theology, kind of the, the biblical theology of it all. But I, I, I'd love to move on to Mr. Sensible um, pretty quickly here if there aren't uh, other comments or questions about um, kind of the explanation John and Berkshire receive as to why why this chasm shows up in, well, everyone's path. Um. And virtue representing the conscience, he becomes very weak and uh, uh, impotent in, in the face of this, this, uh, cap, uh, this great uh, Grand Canyon because moral effort on its own can't get you across the canyon. Just as someone said earlier, reason can't take you to revelation. Reason can analyze a worldview and say what's wrong with it, such as Freudianism. But if reason alone were enough, then we'd just read Plato. We could skip the Bible. Uh, he was, you know, one of the greatest minds of, of all of human history. But he didn't really give us a clear picture of, of uh, transcendent realities. So just as reason failed, uh, also virtue or conscience is going to fail. You, you can't, through your own effort, try to be perfect and try to achieve the kind of... Uh, uh, cleansed life that we uh, look for as Christians. So the, people ask, why does virtue, who's been so vigorous up till this point, become so uh, weak and fatigued and impotent? And that's because he's come to the end of moral effort. You simply can't will your way to uh, the, the higher life, the transcendent life in Christ. And, and on that, David, just this chapter that serves as kind of a... a um... A pendulum of sorts, or not a pendulum, but a, a, a anyway, a, a shift in the plot uh, is chapter three, the self-sufficiency of virtue, and you know John's saying, why would the landlord just make these rules? Because he's still caught up in the idea that the landlord made up the rules, and Mother Kirk is saying, no, this this eating, uh, this eating of the apple, as she uh, has detailed it, she said, infected um, everything so to such an extent. Um, 
I'm on page 76 for those of you who have a copy open and even want to want to go back and look. But virtue seems caught up. You know, it's like Mother Kirk is saying, look, I can help you. And, and virtue says, I must be the captain of my soul and the master of my fate. So even though she's explaining not only the origin of the, the problem, virtue seems almost purposed to try to uh, resolve. Um, doing it on his own is at the root of why this chasm just seems to be uh, causing um, so much of his, yeah, impotence, so much of his inability to, to make any progress. There's hey, also this I, play. Yeah, go ahead. I'm Adam. sorry. I just want to interject real quick on what David Please. said about the sleeping dragons. I really like how in the uh, 1943 to, uh, prologue or whatever it is that, uh, that C.S. Lewis added on, he said that uh, he made it very clear that uh, that the when he's using analogies and because because this is in the context of he just explained a bunch of things and where this metaphor came from in my in my work that i wrote 10 years ago and this is what i would have changed this is where my thought processes have changed he makes it i really like how he says wherever i'm explaining things that's where i messed up and things and the metaphor doesn't uh, supersede explanation. If the, if I could just explain things, then the, the, then I wouldn't need to use metaphor. And the metaphor, in as much as it's been successful, is not something that can or should be explained. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Oh, thank you, Adam. Hello, Mark. Yes, Eric. I that sequence of Mother Kirk talking about the history of the mountain apple, I found one of the most odd things in the entire book. Why, um, Eric? Because it, 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 takes, it takes the idea of original sin and actually turns it into a, uh, a materialistic mechanism mm -hmm. rather than a, um, an act of pride on the human's part. Right, so that 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 was a that was a very strange little avenue for uh, Lewis to uh, walk down. I, I I just I just found that one really odd. Interesting. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I, I I'm curious. We we can talk a little bit more too tonight as we progress uh, or regress about uh, materialism, even uh, as it will relate to. Uh, Further discussions about what is ideal and there's the north-south dynamic we talked about two weeks ago as well all right um anyone else want to jump in based on eric's comment before we get to mr sensible i think eric is right the whole art of allegory is to try to take spiritual realities or philosophical or psychological and give them a concrete embodiment and something like the impassable gorge we thought we were doing very well on our journey but suddenly here's an impassable gorge, the sin of Adam. We can't make it through reason. We can't make it through moral effort. We're stuck. We have to be saved by Revelation, Mother Kirk. That to me is a very effective metaphor or allegorical conceit. I have to agree that the mountain apple is a metaphor of, of uh, original sin or the idea that uh, everybody ate of the apple. And he's trying to say that it wasn't just Adam and Eve. We all have our own Adam and our own Eve. But I would have to agree with Mark that that's one of the less successful allegorical conceits in this story. It's much harder to visualize what he's talking about than the impassable gorge. We can't make it through reason. We can't make it through moral effort. So I guess I would second the idea that the, the novel uh, has very successful metaphors or conceits, and it has some that are less successful. I, I have to confess that when I read the book and Mother Kirk was unsuccessful at convincing on and reason to, to go down under her strength. But I thought this is a this is a picture of exactly what so many people do. The, at, a, at a young early stage, they encounter the truth and it offers them a pathway forward that that is exactly what they want, and they just go, no, it's it what you're saying sounds too easy and you don't look like you could ever accomplish it in any way. And 
-hmm. So what they end up doing is they end up going on a, a, a crazy wild ride around all this countryside and seeing all kinds of things that actually, frankly, they wish they hadn't seen, you know, but it, it had to bring them back full, full circle to that again. Um, I, I, when I read it, I just went, no, 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 turn back, turn back. <laughs> it was a good offer. It was a really good offer. And then I just thought, oh, I see exactly what's happening. I see what's going on. He, he made a right turn when he should have made a left turn. And it was something that, you know, it plagued him till the very end. And uh, now I just wanted to ask uh, David, since he's online here, um, I, I'm Scottish and um, I'm from the Western part of the country, the uh, Inner Hebrides and, and Kirk very often was the term used for the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, right. and uh, actually a, a very good portion of my family uh, because they occasionally got murdered by the neighboring clan is they, they go across and, and pick up a bride or vice versa, find a husband from the section of Northern Ireland that he's from. There was a, an awful lot of mi intermixing there. So I, I was sort of trying to identify with that somehow, but is, is that just a, a really false metaphor or have people explored that avenue? No, you're right. The word Kirk just means church. Almost any name such as Kirkpatrick uh, means the, the church at Patrick or the church of Patrick. So he was quite familiar with that uh, uh, that terminology. In some of his letters, he talks about returning to the Kirk, by which he means the church. But that's definitely Irish, Scotch-Irish. Uh, it's very common terminology. When you look at place names in both Scotland and Ireland, you see a lot of... Yeah, it's very, very Calvinistic Presbyterian church. Not, uh, it not is. The, not the High yeah. Anglican Church. And Northern Ireland, there was a lot of the Presbyterian churches. And that's part of what he rejected was what he called Puritania. He used the word Puritan to mean this kind of legalistic, joyless faith uh, and very politicized faith. Uh, but apparently the word Kirk didn't get spoiled for him. Some people think uh, that Kirk represents Kirkpatrick or reason, which is a total misreading. Because it, it's totally, uh, the idea is the Kirk is Christianity in its broadest sense. Part of the reason Lewis wanted to uh, become a Christian was he discovered that his background was very narrow. You said a second ago that he gets this first approach to the chasm. And here's Mother Kirk saying, please, let me help you across the chasm. And he rejects it and says, let me try reason. Let me try moral effort. Let me try esotericism and following romanticism and sinsook. It wasn't just uh, everybody, it was Lewis himself. This is very autobiographical. He oh, was yeah. given a pretty attractive version of faith in his mother, but she died when he was nine years old. And it took him 20 years to get back to uh, the kind of balanced, welcoming Christianity that his mother embodied in his childhood. I, I wondered if that was that, what that was all about. If it was, you know, when he bumped into Mother Kirk there, if it was really talking about when his mother was explaining what being a Christian meant. And then he had to go the long cycle around before, you know, what was that 22 late, years later, he finally becomes a Christian. Yeah, and I think that's very true of a lot of people from my generation, is you were given a certain version of Christianity and you rejected it and you looked into Hegel and Nietzsche and, you know, every other uh, kind of philo philosophical worldview. And eventually they fell apart and you came back to the faith of your childhood. So I think what happened to Lewis happens to a lot of us. We do receive the invitation early in life, but we have to make almost every uh, mistake and blind alley that we could pursue before we come back and take a more serious look at that invitation. So I think it's both Lewis and it's also all of us. I think Lewis did call himself the most re the most reluctant convert. Uh, right, right. <laughs> and I think we see in this book that agonizing reluctance of him. I mean, he, you know, it's like, it just gets so intense, you know, when we get up towards the climax there, how how desperately he's trying to avoid getting captured or avoid, you know, avoid becoming converted there. You know, it's just, it's, just, you it's, a, it's a subtle moment here on page 77. Uh, and Charles, thanks for um, giving us a chance to really ponder Mother Kirk as a character. But um, the danger of over allegorization or, or autobiographical connection john's character says the old creature is clearly insane so i don't know if lewis would, <laughs> would intend anything of his own mother in that in that statement right. 
but maybe <laughs> to help uh, connect with what you were saying, Charles. Um, yeah, it's like their first encounter is is such uh, in stark contrast to their later encounter, right? So actually, when he was nine, he might have thought his mother was insane. You know, it's. <laughs> I will, I will leave the, uh, uh, those who are still wrestling with thoughts of, of uh, the wisdom reason said maybe Freud captured himself. I'll leave those others who are more interested in uh, Freudian analysis to uh, the chats. But we're going to move on to uh, another important character, Mr. Sensible. And Lewis, um, David, I just really appreciate the way you give not only Lewis's annotation, but then an explanation um, I think there's a really great comment here on um, how Lewis kind of grouped all these potential influences behind the character, Mr. Sensible, again, on page 77 of the annotated version. And uh, yeah, there's even notes in the back uh, with more detailed sketches of these figures for those who, if you don't, again, have an annotated uh, version, uh, David's version here, I, I heartily recommend it to you. It helps greatly when there are such long lists of figures and um but again uh because of where lewis was writing this his friendship with arthur greaves you um david point out that um as lewis noted in a letter to arthur the the dialogue makes clear i hope uh that his quotations were always silly that is the character mr sensible and he always missed the point of the authors he quoted uh, again i think that's that's uh, important to capture here um what what silliness emerges from Mr. Sensible for those who help me uh, trace, trace the lines here. What, what, do, what do John and Virtue uh, walk away from their encounter with Mr. Sensible? First of all, there's another character that joins them in their journey who is serving Mr. Sensible. I think Lewis had a lot of fun in this chapter. I mean, it's, it's, you just, I, there's a playfulness there in this in the beyond, he's not just mocking or he's just he's, he's just he's just enjoying himself kind of <laughs> so <laughs> many yeah bob so many quotations here uh it's just it, numerous uh languages being interwoven allusions to literary uh history ancient mythology and history shakespeare well, in the afterward, I mean, I guess the poor guy just said, I can't, I, can't, I don't have, there are enough books in the world for me to try to, you know, almost to, to sort out all these things. So I'm just going to list all these, I'm just going to list all these and you'll have to look it up there. But it's just... What else is happening in the scene? What is Mr. Sensible having a little too much of? Anyone uh, remember? I, I think my line in somewhere in the notes is, uh, his excessive potation led to his excessive potation. Uh, the more he drinks, the more he becomes incoherent. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it's sad because I think Bob is exactly right. Lewis was having a lot of fun with all these misquotes and all these things taken out of context. Uh, but when I speak about Pilgrim's Redress, people say, I gave up when I got to Mr. Sensible. I don't know French and I don't know Greek and I don't know Latin. <laughs> And you want to say, don't give up. He's a fool. You don't, you don't have to understand what he's saying. There's no wisdom there. So it's a little bit sad because Lewis had a lot of fun writing the chapters, but his readers have very little fun feeling intimidated by all these foreign languages and all these classical <laughs> quotations. But you're basically, you're supposed to realize that he's just a big... Uh, uh, somebody okay. said, I think Martin Luther said, uh, someone who's knowledgeable without being wise is like a donkey with a... Uh, it's like an ass with a bundle of books on its back. And in some ways, Mr. Sensible is the, uh, the donkey with the uh, bundle of books on his back. He's, he's got no knowledge out of all his classical learning. I found it interesting that, um, I forget if that's in one of Lewis's comments or David, one of your uh, explanations there, there was a connection with Emerson. Uh, and I know we mentioned two weeks ago, kind of Lewis's very negative opinions about uh, American intellectuals. And, and we had some good discussion over that two weeks ago. Um, but uh, yeah, the philosophy of all sensible men. 
I see it here on page 80 again uh, in, the, in the annotated version, an echo of the American essayist and poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. I see that, quote, I see that sensible men and conscientious men all over the world were of one religion. This is a quote from Emerson. And this is a, a reference that Lewis makes again in um, those arguments that were added in a later edition. Any, uh, any further discussion on Mr. Sensible, kind of the, the fun Lewis was having or the, the role Mr. Sensible plays? What's, what's the impact though? Again, what, what do the travelers who are basically invited to stay and, and essentially have to uh, politely or not so politely say, uh, we're going to keep moving northward. <laughs> well, they, get Mr. Oh. They, get, they corrupt Drudge or they convince Drudge to, uh, to, to take off there. Or somehow their coming leads Drudge to uh, abandon Mr. Sensible there. What does Mr. Sensible um, find uh, particularly convenient for his lifestyle? Having a slave. <laughs> I just wanted to say something about Emerson. You know, Emerson and Lewis have a certain amount in common because they both like romanticism, but they have something that's not in common, and namely that Emerson is a pantheist and Lewis is a Christian, and so he's going to separate himself from Emerson in that regard. Mm -hmm. And, and also, Bill, if I can uh, engage you just a little bit too, uh, Emerson, if I'm not, a, not an expert on the um, transcendentalist, but right. Emerson is included in that Absolutely, uh, he would be category. part of that. yes. And, and what do you think Lewis's intent was with Mr. Sensible and maybe some connections there to bring out what transcendental re religion and philosophy has in well, connection with and, and in contrast? I think, you know, he thinks it's too vague <laughs> and not, you know, Christianity may have a mythopoeic aspect to it, but it's not as vague as the transcendentalists who are, you know, kind of verging on Buddhism or something. <laughs> so he's differentiating himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sensible. I was going to say, I think I'll play a word with Mr. Sensible here, which is, <clears throat> you know, that he maybe has the pretense of being kind of worldly wise, but he's exposed to be a fool. He basically, you know, and I think Lewis is saying something about the people. I think he's somewhat commenting on the people around at that time who, who go around saying how they would have a sensible view of religion, a sensible view of life, you know, and he's kind of poking his finger at that and saying, no, you're, that isn't sensible at all. Yeah, no, that's right, Bob. Uh, and he was, he, he has at one point a contrast between sense and reason and uh, kind of ends with telling them the name of his home being uh, Greek, the Thelema for will or choice. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about uh, the French author. Uh, I'm going to say the name wrong, Rabelais. Rab Rabelais. Uh, Rabelais, thanks, Bill. Yeah, we, we had some good exchange uh, about that two weeks ago. But mostly the companions um, take taking drudge with them realize, you know, this guy basically is living off of the labor of others and getting to live this way um, in kind of a, not all that self, self uh, authentic, self aware kind of way. You know, it's only when Drudge decides to join them uh, instead of um, harvesting radishes, right? Or uh, mixing up what comes next maybe, but you know, basically serving on Mr. Sensible's uh, desires and all of a sudden uh, things kind of disappear we find out later. Uh, he's, he's just um, living in this, this uh, sensibility without a whole lot of uh, sense for who, who he's uh, dependent upon. I want those to of ask. you who've gone to grad school, those of you who've gone to grad school, you've all met Mr. Sensible. There's a professor who knows Shakespeare, they know the Bible, they know the classics. They're constantly having these pithy quotes, but it doesn't all add up to a real worldview. There's no vision or worldview which holds it together. So it's uh, literally, I had a professor at UCLA who would bring a bottle of brandy to class and uh, we would all have a glass and sit around and quote our favorite authors. 
but it never really, it was sensible, but it wasn't rational. And it certainly wasn't faith-based. And so people like to live in this kind of twilight zone of being erudite and being knowledgeable and having a, a appropriate quote for every situation, but there's no real coherent worldview behind it all. It's not faith, it's not rigorous rationalism. It's just sort of this good natured, what he calls cultivated worldliness. So if you've gone to graduate school, you immediately recognize Mr. Sensible by some other names, I think. Thank you for saying that, David. Um, I, uh, I'm a faculty member at the largest secular university in California, and um, uh, I'm surrounded by Mr. Sensible. It's all these people that are, that are infatuated with the sound of their own voice, and they will quote all kinds of things. They'll draw all kinds of connections with um, even the most remote uh, relationships to what the topic is for the day. And it, when you leave the room, you go, two hours of talking and, and nothing to walk away with, no content. In fact, isn't the name Mr. Sensible perhaps not such a good choice? I think Mr. Erudite would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eric. So Mark, uh, shifting subject a little bit, along with Mr. Sensible, I mean, Drudge is just a fascinating character. And when I was reading it, I couldn't help thinking back to a couple of weeks ago when we were discussing uh, Silver Chair and Drudge reminded me a lot of Puddle Glum, um, uh, a lot of Puddle Glum. No, that's great, Eric. That's a good connection. I want to ask, um, did anyone else in the uh, reading, uh, reading through Mr. Sensible it wasn't until, for me, it wasn't until re reading later in the book when uh, coming back uh, through and they couldn't see Mr. Sensible because there's a substance to him that I understood what Lewis was actually getting at there. But when I went through it the first time, I, my impression of Sensible was uh, that Lewis wasn't painting him as a man who had no substance to his views. I, I thought he was painting him as a man who was completely lukewarm in all of his views. He took the middle road of everything. That was my initial impression. Did anyone else have that impression or mm. that, is that just me? Comfort was a big deal for Mr. Sensible. Yeah, comfort based on the labors of Drudge. In many ways, Drudge kind of represents the working classes. He's very attracted to Marxism in a later chapter. Uh, I agree with you, Adam. If you remember the character in that hideous strength of uh, Wither, he's trying to give advice to Mark Stedick. And he says, now don't take too much initiative. That would be fatal for your career, but also don't be too passive. And he's constantly giving him this advice, which is contradictory. And somehow Mark is supposed to figure out what the middle ground is between all this extremist advice. But it is kind of the, uh, be, because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out. He, he could have been called Mr. Lukewarm in some context, I think. Thank you. I know we're, spending good time in books four and five tonight uh and we do do want to continue our journey but i mm -hmm. think there's a, there's a lot there so i i hate to always rush us down down the path northward in book six to be specific yeah it's kind of nordic fascination there you know with that kind of yeah thanks bob and bear with me everybody i think my internet connection was a little bit on the fritz for uh, book six, we've uh, talked about the pale men uh, a bit two weeks ago, and I know, um, you know, as, as book five goes into book six, this is where Lewis admitted uh, a bit apologetically, he may have uh, been a bit aggressive in his description. But these uh, pale men living in this very uh, simple kind of, um, oh, what is it, like a shack or a hut of some kind, very... Uh, very simple place. They're, they're explaining their uh, genealogies a little bit, who they're related to. We talked about that. But Virtue continues his journey with Drudge to the north, and uh, I found it very interesting that uh, they encounter Savage, this, uh, as Bob was saying, very Nordic mythic figure who uh, I think in Lewis's uh, prescient um, abilities in the 30s was already um, seeing some important historical developments um, going on with uh, not only Marxism, but fascism 
and all these dwarves who gather around in these caves and, uh, you know, talk a lot about uh, the one, the one uh, philosophy of life is to simply um, take up arms in the, in the battle. Uh, to drink, you know, blood from skulls, uh, to, to hear <laughs> Grimhilda explain, Grimhild, um, you know, what it is that uh, Savage has convinced so many people of is the, the main thing. Mark, what? I think he's entered an area here where uh, up to now he's been looking, looking for and been in the areas of truth being important. It seems like he's wandering into the region where might is more important than right, mm -hmm. uh, where power is more important than truth. We can do this, so why don't we? We will. And the bottom line up north is, uh, yes, we'll go down and, and we'll destroy um, it was the, the house of the three men. Just we have the power. We'll, we'll go do it. But it's also a kind of a worship of a kind of heroism, this kind of Germanic heroism there. There's for this, you know, this Valhalla, you know, this kind of ultimate, ultimate pessimism there. But it's it's, it's very, you know, since Lewis was so fascinated with this, you know, with this Nordic mythology there, I think this is where Lewis is really kind of pointing out that the shortfall of that, the, you know, of that whole, you know northern view of kind of which is going to contrast of course with the south <clears throat> with this kind of unbridled hero pagan heroism kind of yeah yeah bill evers did you have something well i wondered if there might be a sly connection to the lord of the rings coming up here <laughs> that's all i would just comment <laughs> Yeah, we two weeks ago, Bill, we were talking about technology, right? And where Lewis yes, we were. And, and the English. And, and I was saying that there is a similarity to Lord of the Rings and, and the serious worries about technology there. Yeah, were these early 20th century Oxford dons, you know, just so pastoral, so uh, uh, Luddite, well, if I, you know? Yeah, that... but it also, it goes with romanticism. And uh, it's, I know that I have maybe have some differences with the rest of you in my severe, cautious attitude toward romanticism. Oh, yeah. But uh, it, it certainly uh, has a tendency to like the bucolic countryside romanticism uh, in its worst form it becomes blood and soil i i don't want to just move along but i may here bill uh that's fine i'm not really wishing to take up everybody with this <laughs> no, it's all right it's all right uh, I, just, I just repeat if you're interested in skepticism about romanticism or where it's gone wrong, uh, you know, the writings of E.D. Hirsch about K-12 education, and he was, of course, a, originally a literary critic whose specialty was romanticism. And, and uh, in poetry criticism, Ivor Winters, I-V-O-R Winters, I might mention also, this is sort of peculiar, but yesterday was the 100th anniversary, the 200th anniversary of the death of John Keats, a famous romantic poet, of course. Mm -hmm. And there is, if you want to hear another really, really skeptical view of romanticism, there is a novel by the poet Paul Lake called Among the Immortals. And it not only takes after romantic poets, but it also takes off out after sort of Faustian arrogance, something that I think Lewis would also be worried about. And it also takes uh, after uh, arrogance and climbing in academia, uh, something that Will, uh, Lewis certainly had plenty of experience in seeing. So anyway, I have enough of that. Oh, thanks, Bill. I, I'm just kind of scanning again who um, in the narrative kind of is reporting on these sites of this, you know, very um, 
kind of that Nordic hall where, you know, the hero's tales are told and there's this feast and um, Lewis has, I think it's virtue kind of reporting back saying something about this, the, the city of Claptrap. This is go back to the beginning of the book where there's this fascination with technology. I, I think this is virtue saying the men of Claptrap may have some excuse for their folly for they at least still believe that your country is a place where happiness is possible. Um, and I may be getting this backwards, but anyway, um, I'm forgetting. Obviously, Lu Lewis is for happiness. <laughs> He's just worried that some of these people are missing some of the ingredients. Mm. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Anyone want to jump in here, Eric? So, Mark, uh, once again, little sidelight, you mentioned uh, drinking blood from skulls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people... A lot of people have this idea of Vikings with horned helmets and you know stuff like that. That's actually a mistranslation or a misunderstanding of a kenning. Uh, kenning is a play on words and it mentions drinking uh, beer from the branches of a skull. So people thought you know, maybe Vikings drank blood from a skull. Well, a branch of a skull is a horn. They used to drink beer out of horns. Now, but thinking of romanticism, I believe it was Lord Byron actually got hold of a skull and, uh, and they actually drank, not blood, but I think they drank wine out of it, he and his friends, which is kind of a fun thing to do. So. Once again, romanticism, Byron is of course emblematic of that. It just, um, and by the way, there's a brand new book on the Vikings on how bloody they really were. Uh, called the the gods of the river, uh, brand new book just just reviewed in uh, uh, Financial Times last Sunday. Lewis makes the point in the preface to this book that romanticism is a very elastic term, and he generally liked words worthy in romanticism, the love of nature right. and simple things. Uh, both he and Tolkien grew up in mostly pre-industrial times, at least where they lived. They knew about trains, but they didn't see a lot of factories or paved roads and that sort of thing. But Lewis didn't like the romanticism of, uh, of uh, Byron at all. We have a book here at the Wade Center where Lewis read uh, Don Juan throughout. There's no notes, there's no comments. Normally he annotated his books, which meant he was engaged with what he was reading. Uh, but at the end of his copy of uh, Lord Byron, Don Juan, Don he just had... Don Juan. Well, actually, the British say Don Juan. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, the rhymes, uh, Byron uses Juan to rhyme with other words. That, right. So obviously it is Don Juan in the correct pronunciation. But at the, at the end of uh, reading Don Juan, uh, Lewis just wrote in the back cover, there's no other comments in the entire book. It just says never again. So when you say romanticism, if you're thinking of Byron and the Byronic hero and the, the egotistical sublime, that whole thing really turned off Lewis when mainly the kind of romanticism that appealed to him was being close to nature, simple folk, as opposed to industrialism. But a lot of that, he wasn't, neither he nor Tolkien were at all economically sophisticated. Right. He didn't say, well, the, putting a factory outside of town will create a thousand new jobs. They would just say, look at this big, ugly thing that's spewing smoke outside of what used to be a pasture. So I think there's a lot of it was emotional rather than intellectual or economic analysis. Their, their resistance to, uh, you know, industrialism and capitalism. I've sometimes heard the romantic poets divided into the light romantics and the dark romantics. And I think Byron and Shelley were considered the dark romantics and, you know, other people like... Um, Wordsworth or maybe Coleridge would be. Yeah, you know, no, I agree with that. And Keats is somewhere in the middle. You notice that several times he he uh, criticizes Keats or, or satirizes Keats in this book. Uh, he liked Keats's poetry, but he felt that his ideas uh, didn't bear up to close examination. And we yeah. see that in this we book. We about that in the uh, Ode to a Nightingale, is it? Uh, where he said that's beautiful images, but when you think what it means, it really doesn't have any particular meaning. Right, exactly, exactly. There's a great line in, uh, in Keats where he says, I've been half in love with easeful death, called him sweet names in many a useful rhyme. And Lewis says, 
well, that would be great to uh, romanticize death if you knew it would be easeful. If, you, if it's not easeful, then maybe that's not such a great uh, approach to death. So I think you're exactly right. He liked the lighter romantics, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, and he uh, tended to not like the egotistical sublime of, of uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Byron and Shelley, and then Keats was somewhere in the middle. But they're, they're, it, even to call them all romantics, it's hard to figure out what are the ties, why are they a school? They didn't get together every Wednesday afternoon to discuss their ideas and agree on what their predominant ideas would be. It's somewhat arbitrary to take those figures and put them all in the same basket in the first place. Hmm. Well, everyone, I want to attempt something here uh, to travel south, west, and east in half an hour. Everyone uh, up for it with me? <laughs> We may do a short shrift to some of it, but uh, again, for those uh, we'd love to encourage to not only read this book, but to join us in the future. Um, I think it's a sign there's so much uh, here, so much richness. And um, let's, let's see if we can go if, south briefly. I apologize for interjecting again. I just want to point out uh, after all this uh, discussion about romanticism, C.S. Lewis details uh, six or seven different types of romanticism in his Mm -hmm. prologue uh, to the 43 edition and he talks about what he meant by romanticism so right. adam there's a great um post that dan hamilton had sent me weeks ago and i put it in the chat two weeks uh during our first discussion i'll try to remember to do that before we close tonight i'll i'll put that link in the chat again um, thank you yeah yeah i'll look for it if you remind me what it was Thanks, Dan. It was yeah a summary a summary of, of the list of uh, from Lewis's preface what the seven different categories of um, uh, romantic romanticism were. So, I sent that to you. Yeah, you did. Okay, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Let me go find it. I think it was on uh, one of the uh, maybe not into the wardrobe, but one of the C.S. Lewis websites that someone had uh, summarized. Anyway, let's go south. Uh, going north in. Um, on the map is again, um, uh, kind of the, the dangers of the intellectual, the dangers of the um, rational. Um, going south are the dangers of the sensual. Uh, as they go southward along this canyon, our travelers uh, encounter this house of wisdom. And I, you know, some say it's Mr. Sensibles that, uh, Mr. Sensible's constant alluding to other things that bog them down. I have to admit the first time I read this, it was in the house of wisdom, even though there's some really interesting characters from history that come out, especially when John uh, has a dream within the dream and goes out in the moonlight and sees how they really act when they're uh, under the illuminating influence. Um, it's wisdom's discussions that become even more to me. Um, Adam, you were saying earlier, yeah, Mr. Sensible seems to have this kind of non-committal lukewarmness. I, wisdom for me, uh, Mr. Wisdom really struggles with that as well. There's just um, a lot there. There's the philosophy of idealism, uh, Berkeley and Kant. There's, there's all sorts of attempts to try to say, you know, the, the truth with a capital T is something uh, connected to the self and whatever is understood historically as spirit or... Um, uh, to use later language, the, the thou, the other. And a lot of it comes out as, well, I'll admit, confusing. Um, am I the only one who is confused by the wisdom that John hears? Anyone else share that experience? I don't know if it's much confusing. It's evasion. They're trying to avoid the landlord, if, you know, to use the, lose the terminology. They're trying to avoid a way to get around having to actually engage with with God or with, you know, with, with something transcendent other there, you know, they're looking, they're going every highway and byway to, to get around that, but, you know, in high, high language, but they're, it's this evasion, this effort of vain. And I think that's very much Lewis is struggling to find the way, find an escape there. And I, so it gets very difficult because it's, it's worldly. The yeah. capital W. Thanks, Bob. There's an exoteric, esoteric dynamic to wisdom. What's uh, esoteric was a little more familiar to me. Exoteric, you don't read that word. At least I haven't too often. What's the difference here? 
Eric, why don't you uh, share for those who can't see the chat? Any any uh, way I can get you to talk about Alistair Crowley? <laughs> there. Um, yeah, the line, do what you will. Um, that was Alistair Crowley's uh, kind of catchphrase. I don't know. It, if comes, it comes from Rabelais. It's, yeah. the, it's the motto of the Abbey that he, that he describes in the Elema? Yes, but Pantagruel and so forth. A Alistair Crowley was active in London uh, during the period of the writing and publication of this book. So um, I'm pretty sure that Lewis would have been aware of who Crowley was. And even if you don't know who Alistair Crowley is, that's probably better. I know who he is. I don't like him. <laughs> Some scary stuff. Yeah, he crossed paths with Charles Williams somewhere in there, and uh, Williams didn't want to follow his particular path. But Crowley is the first one that comes to mind when I heard that, uh, do what you will. Well, he Crowley was involved in the um, Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, but Williams was active in uh, White's Order of the Rosy Cross, which was grown out of oh, Order of the Golden mm -hmm. Dawn. So Williams may have known, well, he probably knew who Crowley was, but whether he knew him or not personally is really questionable. Yeah, good question. Andrew Doja, you mentioned, uh, you know, connections to uh, even contemporary figures like rock stars who, uh, it's always interesting when folks claim to be a part of a, an institutional form of worshiping a, a deity uh, or, or an anti-deity of sorts like Satan. It's always interesting for Satanists. Uh, there seems to be backpedaling when you actually read a little more about what the what the metaphysics are of all this. Well, no, we're just we're just anti-institutional. We're we want to define ourselves what we're against. We, we love we, nature. We actually, yeah, you name it. <laughs> well, it's sort of like Wicca. It's sort of like Wicca too. Yeah. <clears throat> like Wicca. You know, they're kind of not they're, they're dabbling, but they're not self that they're not really taking it seriously there. Or they're just kind Maybe of Maybe they are. I I think you could should always be worried. Well, some may be, but there's other, but many of them are just, it's just, they're 20th century, they're, you know, they're modern, you know, Berkeley, whatever it is, kind of, uh, you know, affluent. <laughs> Family and dark powers. I, I know, Andrew, you were commenting to Dan in the chat, but I just wanted to bring it out a little bit for others to hear. Oh, um, so uh, Marilyn Manson, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, plays a dreadful form of uh, bad noise. Uh, he's not very good even at bad noise. But anyway, he's a, he considers himself a Satanist around the church. Um, and I, I, you know, who knows if it was that he just felt he didn't want to be told what to do or he felt like he wasn't measuring up or I, whatever it may have been. But I read some of his, uh, his autobiography because I felt it was better for me to read something in his own words than to all than all the stuff that I was hearing from other people about him. Um, but he makes it pretty clear that uh, as a Satanist, he he figures he is defining his own good and bad. Uh, and ultimately, Satanism is not about Satan as if there would ever be a Satan uh, too much like God, I think, for him. So he likes himself as God. And uh, Satan Satanism is is worship of the self. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Lewis used the term Satan in uh, his early book, his early work of poetry before he became a Christian spirit in bondage. He has a poem called Satan Speaks. And he doesn't literally mean the uh, theological character of Satan that we understand for Christianity. It was just the, the body, the flesh, materialism. It was the, the mind is trying to rise above the basic physical needs of hunger and lust and propagation. So uh, Lewis started very early on using Satan as a metaphor of something else. Who wrote the satanic verses or the satanic Bible in the 70s? There was this kind of a fraudulent character who claimed to be a Satanist. Yeah, what, 
but he was really just a hedonist. What was that guy's name? LeVay? Um, yeah, LeVay. Yeah, if, if satanic you know, verses is satanic verses has to do with uh, suppressed verses in the Quran. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, I think it's the satanic Bible. But if you look at Anton LaVey, he's not really a Satanist. He's just a hedonist. And so people use that as a metaphor for anything that's against Christianity or anything that's against objective moral values. There's I think we better move on to sort of the chase of virtue and, you know, John's rather abrupt exit from wisdom's house before we get totally caught up in too much wisdom here. You're, you're right, Bob, you're right. Uh, virtue is sick. And uh, the book eight is at bay, which is a, a, I don't know if it's a Britishism, but it's a, a historic, historical way of, uh, yeah, talking about having to face, being cornered, coming face to face with, uh, what is right in front, the hermit there. Uh, John leads the way in a sense, but uh, virtue breaks down, uh, attempts either to stone himself or John. There's kind of this eruption of emotion because um, they've, they've really, maybe not realizing it, entered this place where they're already in the chasm and uh, virtue just in a, in a almost delirious state kind of climbs up the chasm. And John finds himself in a particular climactic moment where in attempting to still chase virtue, uh, he realizes his inability to um, climb out of the chasm. And uh, a character simply named man, the man uh, offers a hand to John and John is given aid and John comes to uh, almost an end of sorts where he realizes his helplessness and um, also takes shelter after some sustenance uh, in the cave of a hermit who speaks a different form of wisdom, a historical wisdom about um, the waters that are a part of this land. And there's rain pouring down and the experience John has, uh, Bob, anything I'm missing here that you really want to get to, I'll let you uh, take the lead here. What what happens to John? Well, I was saying at bay was a chapter, which is what happens when you're, uh, when you're a fox being hunted and you end up you know, with, with no escape route anymore there. And John is basically brought, John is brought to a point of no escape there. Not only has he brought no escape, but I thought the one thing was when he realizes that he's been praying and then and he realizes that there's an implication to that that he can't get away from or he or at that point is willing to say i'm not going to you know i'm you know i've got to face up to the fact that i've been praying here and that means something you know and he actually there's that moment of honesty i think that's a transforming moment in the book there mm -hmm. without which i'm not sure he would have he would not have gotten much further there mm -hmm. we would have fallen down or something but he had that honesty and like you know even though he dreaded it there and he still does this later and tried to go back up the path the other way there. But, you know, there is, I think he kind of realizes that it's a, he's come to that point of meeting <laughs> that he's, you know, he's met the man. He's, you know, he's <laughs> he hears uh, the truths, Eric, I'll let you jump in about um, not only the pagans, but the shepherds, uh, the, the relationship between the pictures and the rules, the um, original and the copy dynamic re-enters and reason herself shows up. We have a lot of these themes. Eric, yeah, go for it. Yeah, th that was the most interesting thing I took away from that whole passage was after getting this wisdom from uh, history, it is reason that drives him back on the path, right? So once again, Lewis has this kind of strange relationship with reason. I mean, he, he really loves reason. And in this case, it's reason that puts him back on the right path. So I, I, I just thought that was an interesting path. Hmm. Anyone else on uh, what comes back into the, the plot line here? Notice how poetry makes its introduction for the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. David Downing, I, I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, help, help us out. 
uh, tell us more. <laughs> well, most of these poems he'd actually written before he wrote Pilgrim's Regress. And as he was writing, he suddenly felt like, oh, this would be a perfect place to drop in. Almost they stand who fell and almost they fall who stand. So uh, that's actually fairly common. You see that in Tolkien in a lot of uh, medieval and Renaissance texts, there will be poetry interspersed with the fiction. You find that in the Romance of the Rose and uh, even Pilgrim Progress. So he's kind of following this literary genre that you try to capture this particular moment in a poem. Uh, so yeah, it's all original poetry and uh, it's his attempt to sum up the feeling of the moments in mostly poems he'd already written. Uh, then people argue about whether they add to the text or detract from the text. Uh, as they also ask with the Lord of the Rings, do we want this poetry or don't we want this poetry? Uh, Tolkien, his favorite part of the whole Pilgrim's Regress was this poem of the, the uh, Northern Dragon talking about how hard it was to be a dragon. And it's funny that Tolkien identified with just the speech of a dragon. Later on, this is written in 33, and then we're gonna have, have The Hobbit in 1937. So that was his favorite part of the whole book was the, the dragon speech coming out of the poem. So Boris Pasternak tried to solve this by putting the poems at the end. Uh, it's about a doctor who's a great poet. Right. And he puts the poems at the end rather than interspersing them. That's probably wise. Most people I know tend to skip the poems in Pilgrim's Regress and they tend to skip the poems in Lord of the Rings. So for some reason, people have trouble transitioning from direct description of action to a sudden meditation. So it's a lot of uh, rhyme and, and wordplay. So I think Boris might've had the right idea. Well, people are a little impatient, I think, in our time there. So you have to be more medievally kind of a medieval timeline or time reference to be able to take the time to, uh, you know, to take that pause and, you know, and, and, not, and not just keep plunging ahead with the plot there. No, it's it's not just poetry, even in uh, nonfiction prose, more than 50% of readers skip over block quotes. If you're writing a book or an article and you have this wonderful pithy quote from Nietzsche or uh, you know, Billy Graham or whoever you think is just stating it perfectly, you should know that, that more than half of readers will skip <laughs> over that block quote, quote. So you're exactly right. People tend to be impatient. So the thing to do is take that quote paraphrase some parts of it, take the really cool, different words, put those in quotes, and weave it right into the text. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. Ooh, we could have a, a breakout conversation after 930 about um, MLA and all sorts of good uh, stylistic things, too. Uh <laughs> I promise you, this is very good advice. And I'm <laughs> yeah. we, the, we, Eric, the, the, I'll let you jump in. Well, the other thing that seemed very, uh, along with the inclusion of poetry towards the end of the book, and I'd have to say there's a lot of sermonizing, um, you know, like people go into these paragraphs that take up whole pages, right, and which is different from earlier in the book. But another thing that ties in interestingly is um, thinking of romanticism the way Lewis describes landscape is suddenly very aligned with the romantic idea, right? Um, earlier, he was describing uh, landscapes in a very utilitarian fashion, but now he actually spends time to talk about the, the beautiful qualities of the nature, which, which I thought was 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 really quite a, a, a marked contrast with the first part of the book. Mark Wimbush. John's a different person, becoming a different person. I was just going to say, if you skip the poems, you miss that amazing line in the North Dragons poem where he says, often I wished I hadn't eaten my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Something has changed. I also, like, I also like the scene at ahead, the pool. That, I also like the scene at the pool when all these other characters come back to dissuade him. There, and it's kind of like, it, 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 you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're 
you know, it's just very human at that point. You're kind of getting ready to make that jump, but all of a sudden you're, you're, you're trying to seek, is someone, is there someone there who can rescue me still? You know, he's it's still kind of this, looking for a rescue that maybe one of these guys is going to say something that's going to convince them to, uh, that maybe he doesn't need to go jump in the pool there. Yeah, they're, they're raised, Bob, right? They, they have a particular form here to almost, uh, you know, if he, if he is in the role of the, the confessor now, um, preparing for baptismal new birth, uh, it's all the ghosts of the past, uh, past journey, right, who come right. to visit. There's a famous passage in Augustine's Confessions where he's on the verge of converting and all his past philosophies are going, what about this? What about this? Do you really want to leave us behind? And they're almost like mistresses. They're saying, do you really want to get married and settle down with one woman? And I'm pretty sure that this whole scene from Lewis is a riff on Augustine's Confessions where all his past <laughs> philosophies are warning him, don't make a commitment, you know, keep things loose and open. It's a brilliant reworking of Augustine in a way that you can all identify with. When, when you're on the verge of a major commitment, you have to have all these second thoughts and doubts and past lives that are questioning what you're about to do. So yeah, I love that passage for its own sake, but also for it, it's such a great reworking of Augustine. Mm -hmm. Well, I just love Lewis's again, uh, in the moment of, uh, the climactic moment of taking the dive. I just love the way, he, and with that, John took a header into the pool. <laughs> Uh, you know, almost, I, he didn't say it was a belly flop, but uh, in my mind, there, there's this um, beautiful, uh, just humility to it, uh, kind of authenticity to John's, this isn't pretty, this is, this is, uh, yeah, it was not a good dive, but at least he reached the water head first. And it seems very important that he go head first there. Which, if you're jumping into, it's never recommended. If you're jumping into unknown waters, there it's very dangerous to jumping with your head. So he's got a really, uh, <laughs> he's got a real trust to actually go in head first, and it's insistent that he that he doesn't play, he can't play it safe. He hears uh, he hears a voice again, the voice explaining the relationship between myth and metaphor, and who they belong to. Uh, in them, the hidden myth is master, where it should be servant. And it is but of man's inventing, but this is my inventing, that this is the veil under which I have chosen to appear even from the first until now. For this end, I made your senses, and for this end, your imagination, that you might see my face and live. John continues to journey with pilgrims and meets a very uh, keen-eyed guide, and is told the journey to the place of his deepest longing is a journey of return. To go forward means to go back. I am racing through, because of the time, uh, one of the most profound passages of the book. And maybe it's fitting uh, to those who haven't read, take up and read to those who have, uh, it stands as um, just beautifully described, even it's even in its succinct. Uh, I think there's two things. One, there's no shortcut. Mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't do the shortcut. And two, it's just that, that what he was longing, you know, even that he has to discover has a different picture. After jumping, after he goes through the dive, it's the baptism, it's different. <laughs> yeah. The guide tells the com traveling companions that to cross the brook again going east is to face what John as a young boy uh, feared the most that crossing the brook is death. But the guide as they sit silent for a while uh, right after this says, you will always be thinking that we call it death in the mountain language. It's too tough a morsel to eat at one bite. You will meet that brook more often than you think and each time you will suppose that you have done with it for good but someday you really will. These are foreshadowings of the regress in book 10. We've mentioned the dragons to be slain, one to the north, one to the south, both in some ways fitting to the characters of John and Virtue. Uh, but along the way, that realization, Adam, you helpfully pointed out that on the regress, things now appear as maybe they truly were, but could not be seen before this change that has occurred. 
or those that or those that could be seen are really basically phantoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were there, but they were phantoms. They were not, you know, so maybe it's somewhat different way of saying the same thing. In our remaining time, I want to talk about the regress, but I, I want to make sure if there were other things that, um, you know, those who haven't commented yet, any clarifying questions or comments about the whole play of the title of the book, not only on uh, Christianity and Romanticism, but the homage to Pilgrim's progress being now Pilgrim's regress. I do want to make sure, I don't know, Ruby, if you had a hand up earlier, I don't want to just, you know, put you on the spot, but if there was something you did want to comment or ask, I uh, want to make space here. I, I blame the cat for that hand raise. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I did read Pilgrim's Progress, so, so I see the uh, similarity in the style of writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's much uh, by way, again, of, of comparison between the two, and uh, again, David Downing, this is a, a real treasure. You can see many of those in the, um, the annotated uh, marginal comments. Uh, David brings out points of, of real contact where Lewis is making um, allusions to Pilgrim's Progress by Bunyan. But David, can I put you on the spot? We'd really, uh, I'd really love to hear um, what you think are kind of the pivotal moments in the regress. What are, uh, but, you know, not only the poetry, but, um, you know, what's for, for those who have yet to read um, maybe what, what's one thing to particularly pay attention to when reading book 10? Well, uh, Lewis is fascinated by the idea of having a return or having to go back. If you recall, if you've read Great Divorce, uh, he calls it that because Blake said that there was a marriage of heaven and hell, that good and evil somehow met in the middle and interacted with each other. And Lewis said, I take this to be a disastrous error uh, that if you're making, if you're on the wrong road, you, you can't just keep going ahead until it turns into good, you have to stop and go back in the direction you came from. And so the idea of regress to him was a very strong uh, spiritual paradigm. In Surprised by Joy, he talks about getting off the train station in Oxford, and he goes in the wrong direction. And rather than seeing all the spires and the wonderful buildings, he sees these kind of depressing suburbs, and he's actually heading toward Botley, which is a suburb of Oxford. And he said, I suddenly realized I needed to stop and pick up my bags and go in the opposite direction. And he says, in some ways, that's been a paradigm of my whole life. So this is a very um, central metaphor to Lewis. He was raised as a Christian. His mother was a great embodiment of Christianity. He gave it up in his teens, and he spent 20 years trying to refine it in his early 30s. And he writes this book in two weeks after becoming a Christian again, or after regaining his faith. So I think the main thing that I noticed is that it happens quickly and everything looks different. Mr. Sensible has no substance, clap track. Suddenly you're seeing culture through spiritual eyes, uh, as you mentioned, the sharp-eyed version. So what you thought was a major philosophy like Freudianism, when you look at it spiritually, you go, it's really very insubstantial. That's not gonna hold up to, to uh, future scrutiny. Um, somebody wrote and said, how come the regress is so short when the progress is so long? And Lewis said, well, I was so young in my Christian faith, I didn't really know what I was going to discover as a Christian. Sure. But I think the key idea is you've got suddenly a whole new lens through which to view culture, and you suddenly realize the proper proportions. What is, I mean, how much of literary modernism really has substance? How much of Mr. Sensible has substance? And a lot of what he thought was very important and something to be grappled with on his progress when he goes back the other direction, the main thing that strikes him is how race-like and insubstantial they are. So I almost wish he had written a lot more on the regress. I think it'd be fascinating to revisit all these characters from a spiritual point of view. But for him, it was very liberating to realize he always felt there was something wrong with modernism. There was something self-centered and narcissistic and neo-romantic and nihilistic about a lot of modernist authors. And once he became a Christian, he kind of said, oh, well, now I get it. This is why I didn't like Lawrence. This is why I didn't like James Joyce. This is why I didn't like other modernist writers. Or this is why I didn't like Emersonian transcendentalism. It was just this vague feeling of emotional uplift, but there was no you know, real taproot into reality there. So I think that this, the basic idea of regress 
is once you become a Christian, you have to revisit all of your cultural history, all your personal history, and reinterpret what you've been going through. And in some ways, it's much easier to understand through the lens of, uh, of faith than it is to understand just as this forlorn figure trying to figure out how seriously should I take Freudianism? How seriously should I take modernism? So as I say, he, he admitted it was a short section because he was a new Christian. I wish he'd waited five years and written a much longer regress section. I think it would have been fascinating. Well, and David, to point out a couple of things you do in the annotated version. So you had mentioned um, in a few moments, uh, a few of the notes, um, the influence of Dante as well. Um, right, right. The, you know, the, the Beatrician uh, guidance and, and kind of understanding of the, the picture of desire, uh, rightly ordered. You know, there's the allusion right. to Proverbs in the um, kind of the title page, Proverbs right. 24. I wondered, again, this character of the witch showing up and the personification of, of the dangers of, of disordered lust. Uh, well, I shouldn't say disordered lust, the lust as disordered love, um, you know, harkening back almost to a proverbial warning between lady wisdom and lady folly um right right uh, and again the fact that these are ways to turn off the road um even though they're they have to travel uh in terms of the imaginative country depicted uh, they both have to travel almost to the edge of the world uh the most dangerous lewis plays a lot on the idea of danger and safety as well mm -hmm. this idea that you know uh Kind of like with Aslan and Mr. Beaver, you know, he's he's not safe. Right, he's good, right. but he's not safe. Right, it's the idea right. that the the regress, if if you're looking for safety, this is not the road. Um, this this road you will travel back on is not going to be safe. And I love this idea that uh, the danger comes from both directions. It's not just these people are good and these people are bad. Right. Uh, when you look at the map, he says that Satan can send his tentacles or his railway. Uh, tracks from both directions. So this arid intellectualism can lead to fascism and uh, Marxism or this kind of uh, worship of the Nordic spirit. But sensualism can lead to lust and magic and D.H. Lawrence uh, kind of worship of sex. So I love the idea that you really have to find the middle path between excessively intellectual and excessively sensual. I think that point really stuck with me the first time I wrote, re read the book. Mm -hmm. Ruby. Hi, um, I, I'm trying to backtrack. What was I going to say about regress? Um, everything for me just goes to simplicity. So when, when we're without God, we're striving on our own merits that leads us in all kinds of wrong directions. So the regress to me is just simplifying to just the very basic me and God or Lewis and God from his perspective. Um, I don't know, just to me, that's just, that's just it. It's just the simplifying and you're describing it as I said, you think you said intellectual to sensual. That's kind of what I was relating to with the animal to human and human beyond to spirituality of, um, in the continuum of instinct to intelligence. Hmm. But he is traveling with converted virtue as well. I mean, virtue is mm -hmm. converted and transformed and Lewis is still you know, Lewis did speak to the virtues. I mean, even in mere Christianity, among other things, you know, he's, he's still mm -hmm. what they were a good guide to uh, when properly converted. <laughs> here, here, Bob, and and with that, and with Ruby's comment, I'll I'll take the privilege of the final um, final word here. Uh, John is shown along with virtue that um, to head back east is to realize that the map is, uh, is a circle, it is a globe, and that the desire uh, was really the landlord's dwelling after all. And so Ruby, I think Lewis gives that beautifully simple image of uh, you know, the desire we are made with and for is fulfilled only by the one who has created us for it. And I thank you all for being here. A particular thank you to David Downing for joining us again and sharing your, uh, your love for this book and uh, the time you've put in. Thank you for your time tonight and to everyone for the conversation. Uh, so grateful to you all.